Hey everyone, this is Paul Gale from PaulGaleNetwork.com and thank you for joining me today for Video Game News. It is September 9th, 2021 and these are the top stories of the day. To kick things off, I've got to say happy 22nd anniversary to Sega Dreamcast. And for this segment, the background image I chose is Mr. Peter Moore's Twitter post and that's because I like Peter. We've been friends for a number of years, met way back at E3 in the mid-2000s, early 2000s perhaps, kept in contact to this very day before he worked at Xbox. He worked for Sega of America, and he definitely had an important role in bringing the Dreamcast to the North American market. So let's read what he had to say. 22 years ago today, on 9999, the Sega Dreamcast was launched in North America ushering in what millions now take for granted, online console gaming. Somehow we got games to run via a 56 kilobyte dial-up modem and generated the biggest 24 hours in U.S. retail entertainment sales history. All very true statements and you know the Dreamcast was quite a interesting system in 1999. First of all it did come out in November of 1998 in Japan so that was quite a gap you know 10 months between Japanese and North American releases but regardless it was interesting because technically it was a next-gen console to the PlayStation and Nintendo 64 you know PlayStation came out in 1994 in Japan 95 in the United States Nintendo 64 came out 1996 in Japan and the United States. So if you look at the gap between PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and Sega Dreamcast, yeah, Dreamcast came out a little over two years after N64 in Japan, but three years after N64 in the United States, four years after PlayStation in the United States. So it was definitely that next-gen system time-wise, right? it followed along the path that obviously came out several years after the Sega Saturn which was Sega's mm, unfortunately failed console during the generation that most people think of ah, PlayStation versus N64 but Dreamcast also came out a good amount earlier than PlayStation 2 which would be 2000 as well as the Nintendo GameCube and Xbox in 2001 so it was really an interesting time. It was kind of between the two, but it was definitely a next-gen console. Like, if you look at this thing from a specs perspective, it is much more advanced than N64, PlayStation, and Saturn, and is, in fact, a lot closer to PS2, GameCube, and Xbox. I think this system should have done better. It obviously opened up really powerfully, right? Biggest 24 hours in US retail entertainment history. I remember when that happened and it was wild because previously Nintendo 64 was the fastest best-selling console in its initial 24-hour period in North America. Sega Dreamcast launched with a good lineup, primarily Sonic Adventures, we had Crazy Taxi, we had uh, Ready to Rumble Boxing, the system went on to being known well for its fighting games from Power Stone to uh, the best versions of Street Fighter at the time, including Street Fighter 3, Second Impact, the only place that you could play those, eventually Street Fighter 3, Third Strike, you know, another Sonic game here, a Soul Calibur game there, uh, House of Dead port from Arcade. Much better graphics than what you were looking at previously on PlayStation, 2, PlayStation and Nintendo 64. There was definitely a level of shine different in how third-party games looked like on all of these systems. Now, of course, eventually, you look at games that were coming out on GameCube, Xbox, and PS2, and they looked better than Dreamcast, but also part of that problem is because Dreamcast died too early. You know, if developers worked on it longer and Dreamcast was still around during the GameCube, Xbox, PS2 era, Who's to say that, you know, Soul Calibur 2 on Dreamcast wouldn't look, you know, too far off from what it looked like on the other systems? Shenmue was a very good looking game on Dreamcast. You know, who's to say that this system wouldn't have been able to pull off well 
Grand Theft Auto 3, San Andreas, Vice City. It's kind of wild to think how premature the drop-off in sales and production and just fan care was for Dreamcast because it kind of came out at an odd time. Sony kind of hurt Sega quite a bit in anticipation of PS2 and Sony's marketing push and comments regarding Sega. Now, I think the system would have fared better if they had implemented a second analog stick for starters. This was the direction that gaming was going. If they thought of a second analog stick now, that would have helped the controller out from that perspective. But more importantly than that, because you could have always released another controller later on, right? Nintendo 64 came out with an analog stick. That was the next level. PlayStation, which came out previously, did not. But the second iteration of the PlayStation 1 controller had not just one, but two analog sticks. So let's say that Sega missed the analog stick mark, which they did, but later on came on came out with another controller, started repackaging it, kind of like they did back in the day with the Sega Genesis. Original Genesis models had three buttons, ABC. Eventually they had ABC, XYZ. So the analog thing isn't the biggest deal, but that would have helped from the moment that it came out of, oh, you could do the following things. That's new. Yeah, that's cool. So that probably should have been part of its design. The 56K modem, that was huge. That was online gaming early on. Nowadays, like Peter said, it's something that we take for granted. Everything's online. Everything's high speed. It's much easier to get online. Your phones are online. You can play a game like that if you want to connect to the internet. But back in 99, it was kind of cutting edge to be able to do so. But I think the biggest thing is, and this was probably just not in the cards. It was too early, but that was a DVD player. DVDs were early prop, early, in their early life, I should say. I was going to say that the medium was still young. When PlayStation came out in early 2000, Japan, and then, you know, October 2000 in the United States, DVD players were still a few hundred bucks. And here was this console that was $300 that had a DVD player on it. I used to work at Electronics Boutique video game store okay and people were buying PlayStation 2 as a DVD player that happened to play games because the PS2 didn't have this fantastic launch with you know killer titles available and in fact it didn't develop a really good library till a while into the system's life in my opinion but it never stopped it from selling well and stuff so what if you could rewind in time and say that somehow Dreamcast came out in November of 1998 and had a DVD player on it. How huge would that have been? Or it had an analog stick, a second one, on its controller. Hmm. Could those things have been enough to help it out? Or what if instead of coming out 11 months later almost in the United States, it came out also back in November of 1998? in the US when it came out in Japan. You know, you've got to say that, well, Sega's in charge, they're responsible for the games they came out, do they have the best software lineup and the quickness of releasing these games, the right partnerships to make it happen so that when they have a gap in development, you know, between a Sonic and a Knights game, for instance, uh, they would have third parties on board, maybe, maybe not. Obviously, things went the way they did, but, you know, it's always that what if, right? What if it came out everywhere in 98? Then the majority of the world would have been looking at, okay, Metal Gear Solid on PlayStation 2, or sorry, on PlayStation, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time on Nintendo 64, and these games that are just, wow, this is what the next-gen terms of visuals are looking like with the early software lineup of Sega Dreamcast worldwide. Don't forget, internet was still very young and not everybody picked up video game magazines. There was no YouTube. So the rest of the world didn't really know necessarily until it came out in the US, 
many months later, what the system was capable of. If it all came out at once, it would have spread more. But regardless, I had fun with the system. I bought it back at KB Toy Store in $99.99 and have some fond memories with it. Still hooked up at my parents' house and the VMU was fun. An interesting way how to introduce some small game mechanics to your memory card. The console had a nice sleek design. It later on had some different models like a black model which looked pretty elegant and overall a powerful, fun video game console one of the last pure video game systems before systems became really into multimedia although I guess you could say the Nintendo GameCube was probably the last because from then on you're looking at Wii and Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 they became the okay now you've got YouTube on it now you could do web browsing on it and stuff like that so uh, it was that PS2 Xbox, Dreamcast, GameCube, eh, technically those four were the last of that era, but yeah. I hold a special place with Dreamcast in my memory and wish it did better, didn't sell as many as it should have, but hmm. hopefully most people today, if you get a, if you got a chance to pick it up, buy one for cheap online on eBay, and if you're old enough to remember what gaming was like back then and you could transfer yourself back in time and play the Dreamcast and look at what else you were playing on the more popular systems like on Nintendo 64 and PlayStation and realize like wow that's what I could have also been enjoying and earlier than PS2 and GameCube and Xbox you know and if you did already experience Dreamcast let me know what are some of your favorite memories what are your, some, of, some of your favorite games on the system but alright Dreamcast happy birthday that's enough on that segment. Let's get into regular news. Yesterday, I showed you a little glimpse of what LEGO had in store for Nintendo in a new partnership. It was Super Mario Tees. Then late last night, I actually saw what it was, but now this is the first official reveal trailer, so let's check it out. It is Super Mario 64 related. I was right with my initial guess. I thought, could this cube open up and be like Mario diorama that you build up from different stages? I didn't know if it would be Super Mario 64 or something else, just the way it would open up. And it opens up differently than I thought, but pretty cool. I was pretty close. Kind of neat, right? I'm going to take a look at that small Part right back here when they fold it back in and you can see that the whole thing opens up and there you go so you have your decoration of the cube you have your decoration of different stages from Super Mario 64 and that's pretty cool. Like I said, I saw a couple of images leak late last night, and I thought ah, I'd hold off until the proper reveal, and it just came, you know, 10 hours later or less. So that's kind of cool. Let me know what you think. Are you interested in this set? Okay. And finally, today in video game news, we've got our weekly Famitsu sales charts coming out of Japan. This is representing week 36 of 2021, occupying that August 30th through September 5th time slot. Thank you, Chris1964 from the ResetEra.com forums for putting this list together. And number one is Ring Fit Adventure with 15,000. Two is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, also with 15,000. And number three is Minecraft, the Nintendo Switch version, with 14,000. At four is Momotaro Dentetsu with 10,000. At 5 is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate with 9,600. At 6 is Tsukehime, a piece of blue glass moon on PlayStation 4 with 7,900. At 7 is Super Mario 3D World with 7,800. At 8 is Pokemon Sword and Shield with 7,700. At 9 is Clubhouse Games 51 with 5,800. And at number 10 is Super Mario Party with 5,700 copies sold. A split of 9 to 1. Nintendo 
Switch to PlayStation 4. Overall, nothing giant, mostly Nintendo on here. We've got some small shifts in percentage from stuff like Super Mario Party, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, Ring Fit Adventure, kind of cool. We've got the usuals. And moving on to hardware, this is also kind of interesting because a couple of things are happening and are going to happen very soon too. What's happening is Nintendo Switch is holding on very well week in and week out despite OLED coming up very soon, one month away. It did 60,000 this week compared to last week's 63,000, which was a good hold. It's down 17,000 from last year, which is expected because I think people are still holding out for OLED by a good portion. And this now puts it at 3,711,000 Nintendo Switch systems sold this year versus 3,689,000 Nintendo Switch systems sold for last year. It's less than 20,000 between the two. I think next week, uh, Nintendo Switch is going to catch up where they're going to be almost neck and neck for 2020, 2021. 2020 will start to overtake 2021. But then the OLED model is going to come out. It's going to balance things out. It's going to put it back in favor of Team 2021. And then we have the last two and a half months of year where they're going to face off and see. Does Nintendo Switch surpass its 2020 self in 2021? We'll find out. I think it will. And number two is PlayStation 5 with 17,000, down 3,000, but still pretty close to last week's self. Xbox Series dropped 2,600, more than half of a drop from last week. PlayStation 4 at 1,400, down from 2,000. 3DS up, the only system that's up, to 746 from last week's 509. Nothing too exciting, but a couple of things happening in the near future, which is kind of cool. All right. That's going to do it today for Video Game News with Paul Gale Network. Thank you for watching. Later today, we have the PlayStation Showcase, which I will be live streaming, and I am excited for that. Let me know what you thought of today's content, and I will see you all later. Take it easy. Thanks for watching. Bye.